Sandy Cheeks is a spy. For who? Sandy starts to panic, and she makes a phone call. A call to the, the Wentworth Bros. The Fairly Odd Parents have an imposter among them. Somebody is actually a fairy in disguise. Like one of the humans? One of the children. And you can tell from the eyes. Every single kid and human does not have pupils. But every fairy, look at all of them. They all have pupils. So when you look at all the children at Timmy's school, one of them stands out and has pupils. Which one? It's Trixie's friend, Veronica. Veronica? I don't even know if I remember Veronica. Veronica's the blonde. She's Trixie's fairy. In disguise. That makes sense. Yeah, because Trixie probably had no friends at school. So she wished for her fairy to become her best friend in order to not look lonely at school. And she could be a popular kid. And it wouldn't be suspicious at all. So the fairies could hide in plain sight. Tom and Jerry are best friends. Aren't they mortal enemies? <laughs> How does that work? That's what they want you to think. Tom and Jerry pretend to hate each other so that Tom's owner doesn't replace Tom with a different cat to get rid of Jerry. So he pretends like he's out doing the best he can to get rid of Jerry all the time. When in reality, Tom and Jerry are kicking it sometimes. That's why they're comrades at the end of the show. That would make sense why Tom makes the stupidest mistakes and can't catch Jerry. It's because it's intentional. Yeah, Jerry can't get away a, a million times every single time. It's just crazy. It's because Tom's letting this happen. Because he doesn't want to kill his best friend. Well, now I don't know how great of a friend Jerry is making Tom look so bad all the time in front of his owner. I mean, he kind of has to. Well, I mean, sometimes he'll pretend to get caught so that the owner thinks that Tom's doing a good job. And then he'll just slip away, like usual. That's a real friendship right there. Yeah, I feel like every single cartoon has a deeper meaning to it. Like there's something there in every single cartoon. Maybe even every single character. Do you remember Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends? Yep, one well, of the best. One of my favorite cartoons. Frankie from Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends isn't real. How is that possible? Frankie is one of the imaginary friends. Really? Madam Foster imagined her. In the cartoon, they say Frankie's her granddaughter. But Frankie lived with Madam Foster all her life. No sign of parents. No sign of anything outside of Foster's home. And the reason Madam Foster imagined her is because Madam Foster wanted to keep her home for imaginary friends running, but she was getting too old to do all the jobs. Frankie's the ghost of Madam Foster's past. So Frankie is there helping the imaginary friends, but she doesn't even realize that she's one of them. The show I might have watched the most on Nickelodeon was probably Drake and Josh. Nick at Night. Yeah, Drake and Josh was my favorite non-cartoon, but it gets super meta. Drake and Josh is a TV show within a TV show. Wait, wait, what? So Drake and Josh is a TV show, but Drake and Josh is also a TV show in Drake and Josh. Would you approve of this? Well, they start out each episode talking to the camera, just like a confessional in a reality TV show, so they know they're on TV. Oh yeah, kind of like breaking the fourth wall. And then Carly from iCarly even references that she watched Drake and Josh. Really? But Carly was a character on Drake and Josh, so <laughs> how would that work? Well, there's one explanation. Carly Shay and her brother Spencer Shay are actors. And they played Megan and Crazy Steve on Drake and Josh. And that's how Carly ended up becoming a viral sensation when she started iCarly. Because she was already famous from the Drake and Josh show. Oh yeah, that's how she got her start. Exactly. So iCarly is just a continuation of Carly's acting career. I mean, it's better than what happened to Drake. <laughs> oh yeah, we don't need to go there. Let's keep him in Drake and Josh. The other brother duo that I loved though was uh, Zack and Cody. I might have watched that more, honestly, than Drake and Josh. Definitely my favorite Disney show. But watching it back now, the sweet life of Zack and Cody is so much darker than I remember. What makes you say that? You have Zack and Cody, these kids, 
that live in a hotel and their mom is a hotel singer, a single parent sleeping on the couch of this hotel room. Yeah, she is kind of like a bit of a degenerate when you think about it. Yeah, it's a tough life. And Cody, the smart one, is always getting picked on. And Zach, the not as smart one, is trying to get attention, so he acts out all the time. Yeah, kind of like the black sheep of the family. And London Tipton, who's supposed to have this great life who's super rich, gets neglected by her dad every single day. He never shows up when he says he's going to show up. And then you have Maddie, the smart, hard-working one, who has to work at a hotel instead of studying trying to get a better life because her family can't afford her a better education. And then to top it all off, you have Mr. Mosby, who just seems like this mean manager of the hotel, but he's actually just trying to be a father figure to London and the boys who don't have one. He's under an immense amount of stress, too. Yeah, I would have those freakouts that he has if I had to deal with all of that. You gotta remember that. His best freakout, though, is the Prindle episode <laughs> when he's trying to teach London how to drive. I don't remember it. He tells her to grab the stick shift. And she's like, oh, the Prindle? Because it says park, reverse, um, neutral, drive. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember. She's a special one. <laughs> All right, we're going to bring it around now. We're going to go with SpongeBob theories. You guys ready? Yeah. <laughs> SpongeBob. <laughs> All right, what do you got? Sandy Cheeks is a spy. For who? The narrator of the show. The guy with that, like, nature documentary voice. Yeah, I know him. That guy. She's a plant to make everything run smoothly in Bikini Bottom for that narrator's show. The narrator's show? Yeah, all of Spongebob is just a big film production by the narrator and his crew. And Sandy Cheeks is his inside man, or squirrel. <laughs> they even put proof of this in the show. Where? In one episode, a green moon comes over and turns all the characters into these devolved-looking creatures. <laughs> oh, what? And Sandy starts to panic, and she makes a phone call. A call to the narrator. The narrator of Spongebob answered the call? Yeah! He answers it in his, like, scuba suit. And Sandy calls him Frenchy. And when he picks up, he says, Don't worry, Sandy. I got it all under control. I see the moon. Don't worry about it. I'm watching. So he's got cameras everywhere in Bikini Bottom. All over everybody's houses. Just to film his documentary show. And Sandy's there to make sure everything goes right. Yeah, I always wondered how she ended up underwater. Uh, it was like a researching grant from these monkeys. At least that's the excuse they gave. Right. The monkeys are probably working with the, the narrator. I was not expecting the narrator to be involved as an actual character <laughs> in Spongebob. Speaking of magical beings, Bugs Bunny is actually a god. He's a trickster god. Oh, like Loki. Yeah, exactly. He always runs into Wile E. Coyote and, and Elmer Fudd. Every time he interacts with them, he's f them. Constantly. Daffy Duck, too. And keeps them from getting any success. And Bugs Bunny is pretty much invincible. Elmer Fudd will shoot him point blank in the <laughs> face. That does happen. Multiple times. And he survives. Hey, Every go time. Gods can't die. He's purposely put there to just mess with Wile E. Coyote and Elmer Fudd. And that's why he's so smart. He does it all for kicks and giggles. That's Bugs Bunny.